Tom's Money by Harriet Prescott Spofford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom's Money by Harriet Prescott Spofford. Read by Don Jenkins. Mrs. Lawton had found what she had been looking for all her life, the man under her bed. Every night of her nearly thirty years of existence this pretty little person had stooped on her knees before saying her prayers, and had investigated the space beneath her bed, a light brass affair hung with a chintz valence, had then peered beneath the dark recess of the dressing-case, and having looked in the deep drawer of the bureau and into the closet, she fastened her door and felt as secure as a snail in a shell. As she never, in this particular business, seemed to have any confidence in Mr. Lawton, in spite of the fact that she admired him and adored him, neither his presence nor his absence ever made any variation in the performance. She had gone through the motions, however, for so long a time that they had come to be in a manner perfunctory, and the start she received this night of which I speak made her prayers quite impossible. What was she to do? She, a coward par eminence, known to be the most timorous of the whole family, her tremors, at all sorts of imagined dangers affording laughter to the flock of sisters and brothers, should she stay on her knees after having seen that dark shape as if going on with her prayers while revolving some plan of procedure? That was out of the question. Scream? She couldn't have screamed to save her life. Run? She could no more have set one foot above the other than if her body had melted from the waist down. She was deadly faint and cold and shaking, and all in a second, in the fraction of a second, before she had risen from her stooping posture. Oh, why wasn't it Virginia instead? Virginia had always had such heroic plans of making the man come out of his hiding-place at the point of her pistol, and Virginia could cock a pistol and wasn't covered with cold shivers at the sight of one, as she was. If it had only been Francie, whose shrill voice could have been heard over the side of the earth, or Juliet, whose long legs would have left burglar and house, too, in the background between the opening and slamming of a door. Either of them was so much more fit than she, the chicken-hearted one of the family, to cope with this creature, and they were all gone to the wedding with Fred, and would not be home until to-morrow, and Tom had just returned from town and handed her his roll of bills and told her to take care of it till he came back from galloping down to the works with jewels, and she had tucked it into her belt, and had asked him a little quakingly what if any of the men of the dead line that they had heard of or red dan or an apache came along and he had laughed and said she had better ask them in and reproach them for making such strangers of themselves as not to have called in the two years she had been in this part of the country and she had the two maids with her and he should be back directly and she had looked out after him a moment over the wide prairie to the hills all bathed in moonlight and felt as if she were a spirit alone in a dead world. And here she was now, the two maids away in the little wing, locked out by the main house, alone with a burglar, and not another being nearer than the works, a half-mile off. How did this man know that she was without any help here? How did he know that Tom was coming back with the money to pay the men that night? How did he happen to be aware that Tom's money was all in the house? Evidently he was one of the men. No one else could have known anything about it. If that money was taken, nobody would believe the story. Tom would be cashiered. He could never live through the disgrace. He would die of a broken heart, and she of another. They had come out to this remote and lonesome country to build up a home and a fortune, and so many people would be stricken with them. What a mischance for her to be left with the whole thing in her hands, her little, weak, trembling hands. Tom's honor, his good name and his success, their fortune, the welfare of the whole family, the livelihood of all the men, the safety of the enterprise. What made Tom risk things so? How could he put her in such jeopardy? To be sure, he thought the dogs would be safeguard enough, but they had gone scouring after him. And if they hadn't, how could dogs help her with a man under the bed? 
it was worse than any loss of money to have such a wretch as this so near one so shudderingly so awfully near to be so close as this to the bottomless pit itself what was she to do escape the possibility did not cross her mind not once did she think of letting tom's money go all but annihilated by terror in the heartbeat she herself was the last thing she thought of light and electricity are swift but thought is swifter as i said this was all in the fraction of a second then mrs lawton was on her feet again and before a pendulum could have more than swung backward the man must know she saw him she took the light brass bedstead and sent it rolling away from her with all her might and main leaving the creature uncovered he lay easily on one side a stout little club like a policeman's billy in his hand some weapons gleaming in his belt putting up the other hand to grasp the bedstead as it rolled away you look pretty don't you said she perhaps this was as much of a shock to the man as his appearance had been to her he was not acquainted with the saying that it is only the unexpected that happens get up said she i'll be a man if i was a man get up i'm not going to hurt you if the intruder had any sense of humor this might have touched it the idea of this little fairy queen of a woman almost small enough to have stepped out of a rain lily hurting him but it was so different from what she had been awaiting that it startled him and then perhaps he had some of the superstition that usually haunts the evil and ignorant and felt that such small women were uncanny he was on his feet now towering over her no he said gruffly i don't suppose you're going to hurt me and i'm not going to hurt you if you hand over the money what money opening her eyes with a wide sort of astonishment come none of your lip i want that money why i haven't any money oh yes i have to be sure but i thought you'd remember it said the man with a grin but i want it she exclaimed i want it too said he oh it wouldn't do you any good she reasoned fifteen dollars and it's all the money i've got in the world i don't want no fifteen dollars said the man and i don't want none of your chinning i want the money your husband's going to pay off with oh tom's money in quite a tone of relief oh i haven't anything to do with tom's money if you can get any money out of tom it's more than i can do and i wouldn't advise you to try either for he always carries a pistol in the same pocket with it and he's covered all over with knives and derringers and bulldogs so that sometimes i don't like to go near him until he's unloaded you have to in this country of desperadoes you see yes i see you little hen sparrer his eyes coming back to her from a survey of the room that you've got tom's money in the house somewhere and would like to throw me off the scent if i had she said you'd only get it across my dead body hadn't you better look for it and have me tell you when you're hot and when you're cold come he said again i've had enough of your slack you're not very polite she said with something like a pout people in my line aren't he answered grimly i want that money and i want it now i've no time to lose i'd rather come by it peaceable he growled but if well if you can take it of course you're the stronger but i told you before it's all i have and i've very particular use for it you just sit down she cried indicating a chair with the air of having really been alone so long in these desolate regions as to be glad of having someone to talk to and throwing herself into the big one opposite because in truth she could not stand up another moment and perhaps feeling as if a wren were expostulating with him without robbing her nest the man dropped the angry arm with which he had threatened her and leaned over the back of the chair there it is she said right under your hand all the time you won't have to rip up the mattress for it or rummage the clothes press or hunt through the broken crockery on the top shelves of the kitchen cupboard she ran on as if she were delighted to hear the sound of her own voice and couldn't talk fast enough i always leave my purse on the dressing case though thomas told me time and time again it wasn't safe but out here stop thundered the man if you know enough to stop stop or i'll cut your cursed tongue out and make you stop and then i suppose you'd gurgle that's not what i want though i'll take it i've told you time and again that i want the paymaster's money that isn't right under my hand and where is it i'll put daylight through that little false heart of yours if you don't give it to me without five more words and i've told you just as often that i've nothing to do with the paymaster's money and i wish you would put daylight anywhere 
for then my husband would come home and make an end of you and with the great limpid tears overflowing her blue eyes rose lawton knew that the face she turned up at him was enough to melt the sternest heart going you mean to tell me said he evidently wavering and possibly inclining to doubt if after all she were not telling the truth as no man in his senses would leave such a sum of money in the keeping of such a simpleton i don't mean to tell you anything she cried you won't believe a word i say and i never had any one doubt my word before i hate to have you take that fifteen dollars though you never would in the world if you knew how much self-denial it stands for every time i think i would like an ice cream out in this wilderness where you might as well ask for an iceberg i've made tom give me the price of one you wouldn't find anything but ribbons there and when i felt as if i should go wild and could have a box of Hyler's candy i've made tom give me the price of that there's only powder and tweezers and frizzes in those boxes as he went over the top of the dressing case still keeping a lookout on her and when we were all out of lager and apollinaris tom couldn't that's my laces and i wish you wouldn't to finger them i don't believe your hands are clean when tom couldn't get anything to drink i made him put the price of a drink and lots of ten-cent pieces came that way and but i don't imagine you care to hear about all that what makes you look at me so for the man had left his search again and his glance was piercing her through and through oh your eyes are like augers turning to live coals she cried is that the way you look at your wife do you look at your children the same way that lay won't work said he with another grin i ain't got no feelings to work on i ain't got no wife or kids i'm sure that's fortunate said mrs lawton a family wouldn't have any peace of their lives with you following such a dangerous business and they couldn't see much of you either i must say i think you'd be a great deal happier if you reformed i, I mean well if you left this business and took up a quarter section and had a wife and look here cried the man his patience gone are you a fool or are you bluffing me i've a mind to knock your head in he cried and hunt the house over for myself i would if there was time you wouldn't find anything if you did she returned leaning back in the chair i've looked often enough when i thought tom had some money i never found any what are you going to do now with a cry of alarm at his movement i'm going to tie you hand and foot first oh i wouldn't i'd rather you wouldn't really i promise you i won't leave this chair i don't mean you shall oh how can you treat me so she exclaimed lifting up her streaming face you don't look like a person to treat a woman so i don't like to be tied it makes me feel so helpless what kind of dumb fool be you anyway said the man stopping a moment to stare at her and he made a step then toward the high chest of drawers half bureau half writing desk for a ball of tape he saw lying there oh she cried remembering the tar baby don't don't go there for mercy's sake don't go there raising her voice till it was like the wind in the chimney oh please don't go there at which as if feeling morally or rather immorally sure that what he had come for was in that spot he seized the handles of the drawer and down fell the lid upon his head with a whack that jammed his head over his eyes and blinded him with pain and fury for an instant and in that instant she had whipped the roll of money from her belt and dropped it underneath her chair i knew it she cried i knew it would it always does i told you not to go you shut your mouth quick roared the man with a splutter of oaths between each word that's right she said leaning over the arm of the chair her face like a pitying saint's don't mind me i always tell tom to swear when he jams his thumb i know how it is myself when i'm driving a nail it's a great relief i'd put some cold water on your head but i promised you i wouldn't stir out of the chair the man went and sat down in the chair on whose back he had been leaning i swear i don't know what to make of you said he rubbing his head ruefully you can make friends with me said she that's what you can do i'm sure i've shown you that i'm friendly enough i never believe any harm of any one till i see it myself i don't blame you for wanting the money i'm always in want of money i've told you you might take mine though i don't want you to but i shouldn't give you tom's money even if i knew where it was tom would kill me if i did and i might as well be killed by you as by tom and better you can make friends with me and be some protection to me till my husband comes i'm expecting him and jules every moment the man started to his feet do you say that he cried holding his revolver under her nose look right into that gun we'll have no more fooling it'll be your last look if you don't tell me where that money is before i count three she put out her hand and calmly moved it aside i've looked into those things ever since i've lived on the prairie said she and i dare say it won't go off mine won't 
besides i know very well you wouldn't shoot a woman and you can't make bricks without straw and then i've told you i don't know anything about that money you are a game one said he no i'm not she replied i'm the most tremendous coward i've come out here in this wild country to live and i'm alone a great deal and quake at every sound and every creak of a timber every rustle of the grass and you wouldn't know anything about what it is to have your heart stand still with horror of a wild beast or a wild indian or a deserter a deserting soldier there's a great apache down there now stretched out on his blanket on the floor before the fire in the kitchen and i came up here as quick as i could to lock the door behind us and sit up till tom came home and i declare i never was so thankful in all my life as i was just now to see a white face when i looked at you well i'll be apache cried the visitor see here little one you've saved your husband's money for him you're a double handful of pluck i haven't any idea but you know where it's hid but i've got to be making tracks if it wasn't for waking that apache i'd leave red dan's handwriting on the wall and almost while he was speaking he had swung himself out of the window to the roof of the porch and had dropped to the ground and made off mrs lawton waited till she thought he must be out of hearing leaning out as if she were gazing at the moon then she softly shut and fastened the sash and crept with shaking limbs to the door and unlocked it and fell in a dead faint across the threshold and there when he returned some three-quarters of an hour later tom found her oh tom she sobbed when she became conscious that she was lying in his arms his heart beating like a trip hammer his voice hoarse with fright as he implored her to open her eyes is there an apache in the kitchen end of tom's money by harriet prescott spofford read by don jenkins